morning, church. I'm Hez, one of the elders here, and I have a simple word for you this morning. And so hopefully I won't be before you very long. Amen, church. It's never good when a black preacher says that. (laughs) Let us pray, church. Father, have your way. Use me, Lord, for your glory, that your word may be clear, that it may speak to hearts, and that it may shape and form us as sons of God this morning. May it be for your glory and for our good, in Jesus' mighty name, amen. One of the most heard and well-known pieces of wisdom given by a parent is the instructions for their kids to watch who they hang with. I can remember church receiving those instructions as a child myself. And now that I have become a parent and am sometimes in the presence of high school kids, I realize, church, that those instructions are also one of the most ignored pieces of wisdom given by a parent. I am sure, church, that that some of you might have heard those famous words once or twice yourself growing up, but have you ever really considered why who you hang out with is important? One reason is simply because our parents didn't want us to get caught up in some mess. Amen, church? Meaning they didn't want you to end up in the wrong place at the wrong time. And though that is, that is good enough reason, church, I truly believe that, that, that this piece of wisdom goes a little deeper than just protecting you from being in the wrong place. But there is something, church, about about how those who you you hang with affect not only where you go, but who you become. There is something, church, about how those who, who are closest to you influence how you are being formed and are being shaped. This is why some parents say that that some friends are a bad influence. Because there is something about how our, our relationships of, and, and, the, and those who in, influence us in, in affect how we are being formed. Meaning, church, those who you are around and those who you listen to affect how you make decisions and how you think. They affect what you say and what you do. In other words, those influencers in your life that you, that you are giving your time to are truly shaping who you will be. I'm sure that many of you today wish that you can go back in time and choose better friends. I'm sure that many of you wish you could go back and, and undo some of those dating relationships that you were in. Some of you may not even date at all, if truth be told. Not only would some of you go back in time, but I am sure that, that if, you, if you truly believe that, that those who you are around affect how you will be shaped, that even today, <laughs> you would consider some of your relationships You would consider who you're being influenced by. You would truly consider who and what you are listening to. Have you ever considered, church, that you are being formed? That you aren't just something, but but that you're being that you're being made into something. And that that process of of becoming who you will be does not end until you go to glory. You're not too old to be formed this morning, church. Have you ever considered 
that our time here on earth could truly just be a lifetime of being formed for eternity. It feels like sometimes we approach this life as if our formation uh, ends at adulthood. But I believe that Paul wants us to know this morning that, that those famous words that, that your parents spoke to you as a child are still worth their weight in gold. As he calls us to consider and watch who we hang with. As he calls for us to consider those who we are in relationship with. In other words, church, our main point today is consider who is forming you as your formation will determine your fruitfulness. Paul wants us to be reminded that our relationships are important as they not only affect how we are being shaped, but how we will be used. It, it, it affects how we will be used for life in the kingdom. Therefore, in our text this morning, Paul pleads with the Galatians and us to truly consider this wisdom today, to take it into consideration, to, to think about who we are being formed by as he reminds us that our relationships matter. He begins in Galatians 4, verse 12, by not only encouraging us this morning, church, but by truly pleading with us. He pleads with us to see the importance of this as he calls for us to become as he is. He says in Galatians 4.12, brothers, I entreat you, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. Paul begins this, this passage of scripture by giving us this sort of paradox that can at first read come off as both confusing and arrogant as he entreats or, or begs these brothers and sisters to become like him. <laughs> Though it might seem that this way on the, on, uh, on the surface is, is Paul saying, come on, come on, follow me, be like me. If we just dig a little deeper, we will see that much like the wisdom of our parents, Paul's wisdom here carries much greater weight than that. As Paul is not only calling for these believers to be who he is, but to become what he is truly being formed into. He is calling them to follow in the ways that he modeled church before them to become what they saw and experienced through his time and relationship with them. He is, he is saying to them first, realize that you're becoming something and realize that what you are being formed into is important. Important enough that he would beg them to consider it. If we remember last time, church, when we was in Galatians, Paul helped us to see that though we were once those who were like slaves, now we have been declared as sons of God. Meaning that we were spiritual, we were as spiritual, um, we as spiritual orphans have been adopted into the family of God through the work of Christ. And, and now that, that we have the rights of a son, Paul, as our elder brother church, is calling for us to truly become one. <laughs> to walk in the family way, church, and to carry the family legacy. One of the things that, that we, we, we try to help our kids in, in our home to truly understand is, is just how much influence the older ones has on the younger. We can see it as the, as the, the younger ones mimic the behavior of the older. And one of the main reasons why this is, church, is because siblings, the, the, the relationships that they spend their most time with is each other. That's their closest relationship. 
And so Paul, as our older brother in the faith, realizes this this truth and, and he is pleading with the church in his absence to be reminded, church, of their time together, to be reminded of, of when he was with them, to let their memories lead them to follow in the ways that he modeled before them. Though me and my brother don't really write to each other, church. (laughs) We do find ourselves many times calling each other up. And we do this, church, just to simply recall significant times together. Significant times in our lives that come to mind that we both enjoyed and found challenging. And the reason why we do this, church, is because those times are important to us. Those times have shaped us, and it has shaped how we live and make decisions. And as we remind each other of those times, it reinforces certain parts of our identity. In other words, church, sometimes... We need to be reminded of what the Lord has brought us through. (laughs) I can't get an amen. It's okay. We need to be reminded, church, of where he has brought us from and, and where we were before he encountered us so that we can truly see the significance of of how our life has changed since we met him. Amen, church. Paul, as he writes to these believers, is doing the very same thing. He is reminding them of the significance of their time together, and he is essentially calling them up and saying to them, do you remember? Do you remember how I came to you? Do you remember how I came, church, not expecting anything from you, but instead simply came as a servant to serve you? Remember how I became as you are. In other words, Paul is reminding them, church, not just of when he came to them, but he's reminding them of how he came to them. How he came to them in freedom and humility. And he is calling for them to see the significance of of what that produced in them. (laughs) He wants them to remember the fellowship that that they were able to enjoy together as he was willing to adapt to their ways. (sighs) He wants them to see how his Freedom allowed him to move in a way, church, in which he could truly know them. In other words, Paul did not come imposing his customs and and preferences on them, but instead he came to them displaying, church, a character of curiosity, of wanting to know more, of, of wanting to know them, a character of humility and love. He came to them willing to eat whatever they ate, willing to enjoy their presence and fellowship and to be with them and to dance to the songs that they sung. He didn't let their natural differences become an obstacle to his supernatural mission. In his freedom, Paul was willing and able to truly become as they were for the sake of the gospel. In other words, Paul modeled before them. I know y'all are looking like I'm not sure, Hez, but he modeled before them the very thing that he says in 1 Corinthians 9 and 19. As he says, for though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To to those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. 
To the weak, I became weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. He says, I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I might share with them in its blessings. Church, as Paul is reminding them of how he came to them, he is encouraging them not to see uh, uh, what, he, what he modeled before them as, as just something significant that he was doing just because, but rather he is, he is encouraging them to see the significance of this as it affected their lives and ours. Listen, church, Paul goes through his resume. In the beginning of this letter, he says, I was a Jew of Jews. I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He says, he says, I did all these things for myself. And then something changed. Something shifted in me. I was the most zealous one who was willing to kill for what I believe and who I was and my customs and my traditions. And when I met Jesus Christ, something inside of me shifted, church. It released me from everything that the world was trying to call me to. And he says I became free to become as anybody is. I can walk in any room and be with people and enjoy their presence because I have submitted myself to the work of the Holy Spirit. I'm too far in my sermon. Let me get back. Let me get back. It is through the modeling of this freedom and humility that creates a space. For, for the Holy Spirit to truly work. It's this freedom and humility, church, that, that creates a space for the gospel to be revealed. This walk that, that we walk is, is important as it, as it coincides with the message, church, that the message might become a true reality. And so Paul is encouraging us and these believers to walk in this way of humility, a freedom and humility that allows for that indwelling spirit to truly shape us. You see, Paul realizes that freedom doesn't mean, church, that you are just free to do anything But he realizes that true freedom from the ways of the world makes us available to be influenced and formed by the Spirit. Therefore, the more we break free from the ways of man, the more we can submit to the ways of the Spirit. This is why he says in Romans 6 and 22, church, but now that I have been set free from sin and have become slaves, uh, of that you have been set free from sin and become slaves of God. The fruit you get leads to sanctification and it's in eternal life. In other words, it is our freedom in Christ that allows us to be made like Christ. (laughs) And the more we become like him, the more our lives will produce his fruit. And so as Paul calls for these believers, church, to become as he is, he is truly saying for them and us to become like Christ. (laughs) As he is calling for us to walk in a freedom that allows for us to take the gospel to all, a freedom that, that doesn't allow obstacles like cultural differences and political differences and economical differences to become a hindrance to the truth of the gospel. Many times, church, it is our unwillingness to unhinge ourselves from our preferences and customs that truly hinders gospel mission. We don't realize how our elitism and our arrogance, how our tradition and legalism sours the taste of the good news. But Paul knows this, church. 
This is why he gives us that resume. (laughs) Because he wants us to see what he was so that we can truly understand what he has become. And that becoming, church, is, is, is a result of submitting what he is and who he does to the work of the Spirit, to being formed by the one who indwells us. This is why he says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer who? It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Hmm. Paul says, remember how I came to you and how you received me. Not only did I come to you Gentiles as a Jew, but he says, I came to you with, with, with a physical sickness, a physical sickness and a cultural difference that, that naturally would have caused you to reject me. But see the fruit. But instead, he says, you received me in that state who I am as an angel or as Jesus Christ himself. Paul says, see the fruit. See the fruit of walking in this way. When I came to you, you said that must be Jesus. See the evidence of the spirit, not only working in me, but working in you. You received me. And not only did you receive me, but he says, you received my gospel. See how that made an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to change and shape you. As the Holy Spirit changed and shaped my heart, my heart that was hard, unmoldable, that only saw one way to a heart that now comes willing to serve you. Paul is saying, see the evidence of me, counting you and your needs as more significant than mine. See how I gave myself to you that I might know you and that you might know me so that through my life, the love and humility of Christ might be evident to you so that that the truth of his gospel might truly be revealed. So that as we grow in relationship together, you might, you might be affected by this way and also walk in it. He wants them to remember the fruit uh, of, his, of his coming to them so that they would see how they also reciprocated this way, a mutual freedom and submission that allowed for a supernatural work of fellowship and unity that impacted their lives significantly. Paul is trying to help us see that it's not, it's not enough to just say you believe, but that believing should also lead to doing, <laughs> James, somebody. <laughs> that this gospel that we believe should live to living in a new way. And Paul is calling for us to live out this new way. As I listen and look at those today who are claiming to be Christians in this world. If I'm honest, it feels like many have drifted from this way. It feels like many have forgotten what it truly looks like to be a receiver of this way and then to to model it before others. And because of that, it has caused us uh, to truly move away as a church in America from gospel mission. I believe that we have allowed for some some voices to come in, for some influence to come in and and to lead us to believing that, that, that the mission field is our enemies. And they have convinced us to bear down and fight for our cultural ways and traditions rather than calling for us to truly give ourselves to the Spirit, to give ourselves to a submission that would lead to a freedom and humility to be used by the Spirit, a freedom and humility that would make us more like Christ. But instead, we have allowed fear and frustration of losing power to lead us to putting the walls back up that Christ gave his very life to tear down. 
And rather than going to the world, we have retreated from it. I might step on some toes with this one. But I have to be honest, church. I am, I'm, I'm grieved by, the, by our public school systems. And I wonder if we have considered that, that our, our schools have become that way because in fear and frustration, the church has sort of retreated from them. I, I do. I'm, I'm, I'm just, can I be honest? I, I just wonder if we have allowed the world to remove us from them. I'm not saying that we all should, should send our children to public schools, but, but what I am saying is I wonder how many of us have, have truly counted the cost of going to that mission field. Have we considered the fruit that the Spirit could bear there? Church, <clears throat> Uh, so I've been, I've been doing some chaplaincy for a football team, high school football team, and I'm, I'm telling you, it's one of the ripest fields there is. There's so much brokenness there. And, and I was almost in tears as I'm looking at these children and, and the way that they are carrying on. And I'm just, I'm just like, where's the church here? I know they took prayer out of schools and have made it tough for us to remain there. But sometimes, church, all they need is for us to be like Paul. Just to walk in humility and love before them. Sometimes all they need is for us to just give ourselves to the spirit that he might create a supernatural opportunity that against all odds would allow for supernatural fruit to be birthed in their lives. I thank God for those like Kylie and Tristan who, who give themselves to, their, to that work. And I pray that there will be many more who would consider it. I pray that we would, we would be able to, infilt um, to uh, uh, infiltrate many unreached areas, church, for the glory of God. Where we're counting the cost, church. Where we're in love and humility are, are giving ourselves to serve these areas. Paul says, remember. Remember how it was when the gospel came to you. Remember how you were and how your life changed because of it. And he's saying, count the cost to do the same for someone else. So that you might be used in the same way. That does not mean that in your freedom we conform to the world, but it means that we must be willing to go. It means we must be willing to give ourselves to others in every way that does not conflict with the way of the gospel. The late Tim Keller says it like this. He says, a ministry that is energized by the gospel is flexible and adaptable with everything apart from the gospel. Let us be those who truly walk in this kind of freedom that we might be those who can truly be used for gospel mission, that we might be formed and used by the Spirit for the glory of the God, uh, for, for the glory of God and the good of others. Therefore, Paul says, become as I am. I know I'm only on point one. <laughs> and in that same way, Paul pleads with us to beware of what they are. As Paul writes to these brothers and sisters to find, uh, as, he, as he writes to these brothers and sisters, he finds himself perplexed. He's perplexed as he thinks back on their time together. Because he can't believe, church, that after all that they saw and experienced, that they would be drifting away from this way. Therefore, he says to them in verse 15, what then has become of your blessedness. In other words, Paul is saying, what happened, church, to the, to the evidence of the Spirit working in you? What happened to the fruit that was being birthed in you? Fruit that was a result of your freedom and humility that comes from being a blessed son of God. And if you wasn't here last time, son of God means son and daughters of God. Paul, in his questioning of their blessedness, is calling them, church, to, to examine themselves, 
to examine their lives and, and he is calling for them to see how their lives have, have changed due to the relationship with these influencers that have come to them. He wants them to see the absence of their unity and fellowship with him so that they might see their, how their abandoning uh, of the way that, that he modeled for them is now changing them into something different from him so that they might see what they are being formed into. He says in verse 16, have I become your enemy <laughs> for telling the truth? In other words, how can you go from those who in my sickness was willing to gouge your eyes out that you would give them to me to now where I have become your enemy? Preaching the same gospel that I did then. <laughs> he says, I'm, I'm, I'm perplexed about you. I'm perplexed about your blindness that you have become so blind to how that relationship has affected your formation that you are blind to how they have influenced your life. He says, take a look at the fruit that your, your relationship with them has birthed in you, fruit that produce disunity and disregard, fruit that produce separation and pride. Paul is saying, look at how this, this self-serving way that you learn from these men is leading you to the same. Recognize. How they boosted your ego by making much of you, but refused to eat and fellowship with you. How can both of those be true? How can they think so greatly of you over here, but then deny you access to them over here? How could they truly love you, but then refuse to do life with you? to truly enter yours, that they might truly know you. He says, the only reason for this, the only reason why they came to you is not because of what they saw in you, but they came simply so that you would make much of them. Paul wants them to see that they never truly cared about them or their good, but their agenda was about boosting themselves up church. Is this not what we see today? <laughs> Have you considered the whole idea of influencers? <laughs> Those whose main idea, uh, uh, agenda is to identify with you so that you might build them up? Those who are truly looking to build platforms rather than people? Working in every way to convince us to get behind us, trying to convince us that they are like us. Have we considered that they are just forming us into what they are? Those who seek the self-seeking way as significant. That's something that we should consider and chase, a way marked by division, a way that causes us, church, to dig our hills deeper in the sand rather than becoming pliable for the gospel. The interesting thing about influence is, is that they rely on the us as seeing them as something greater <laughs> so that they can continue the growth of their following so that they can continue to promote themselves. Paul wants these believers and us to see that they are essentially enticing us back to a way of slavery. where serving ourselves is the goal of every relationship that we have. A goal that led to those relationships that many of you, as I talked about relationships from your past, was the, the main goal for you. <laughs> How do you think we ended up in those relationships in the first place? Most of the time, it's because we saw something in that person that we thought would provide something for us. Something that we desired. But let's imagine, church, what if Christ pursued his relationships in this way? <laughs> if his relationships were centered around what others could do for him, can you imagine if Christ was more concerned about himself than us? <laughs> we would all be in trouble because we have nothing to give him. He says, even our good works are like filthy rags in his sight. 
If Christ approached his relationships in this way, then he would have stayed in glory, enjoying his fellowship with the Father and the Spirit, those with which he was fully satisfied. But instead, church, Christ loved us because he was more concerned about our needs and what he could provide for us rather than what he could gain from us. He came to us, church. He gave himself. He left his perfect fellowship and glory, and he did what? Became like us. He put on flesh and subjected himself to our ways so that we might be brought into his, his righteous family so that we might have fellowship with him. He subjected himself to suffering, church, to the point of death so that we might have freedom and life to walk by the ways of the Spirit. And so that through that freedom and life, fruit might be produced in us and through us, that we might be made like him. So that in his absence, others might, See us and know him through us Mm. so that their encounter with us as we are submitted to the spirit would be as if we were an angel or the very presence of Jesus Christ himself. A presence that truly produces change in the hearts and minds of people. This is the way, church, that we're called to. And Paul is causing us to beware of of any other way, of any other mindset and attitude. And he is calling for us uh, uh, to question, what are we seeing? What fruit are we seeing in our lives? So that we could see who's influencing us. Ask yourself this morning, if those who you are listening to And spend the most time with is making you different from this way. Rather than centering on the grace and glory that has brought us together. Are are they calling for you to be divided and cut off? If they are, church, you should question their way and flee it at all cost. Let us here at King's Cross be be something different, church, as we shed ourselves of of unfruitful relationships. Let us beware of relationships that are centered around serving self. Relationships that that look to shut certain people out who don't meet our man-made standards. Paul wants us to know that there is too much at stake. Yes, church, God is sovereign and he will, he will bring about his purposes, but that does not negate our responsibility. <laughs> he has tasked us with the call to go. He has brought us into his kingdom and he had, has invited us into fellowship with him for what, church? For the very purpose of sending us out. <laughs> that we might be like Christ. We must take this call serious, which means we must truly give ourselves to being formed by the spirit, a formation that comes through freedom, freedom that produces humility and love, humility and love that allows for unity and fellowship, unity and fellowship that draws people in rather than shutting them out. Unity and fellowship that sees the needs of others as greater than our own. Therefore, Paul says, be warned of the ways of man. Let us be warned of their fruitlessness and destructiveness. Let us be those who truly are willing to bear with others like like a woman in labor until Christ is formed in them and us. Those who are willing to be flexible, those who are willing to go, those who will become like others for the sake of gospel mission. So that as we are going, we will be made like him. So that we, like Paul, might be able to truly say, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I, I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. May this be us, church. Let us pray.